<laughs> guys, this interview is literally a barn burner. That's what I'm going to call it, a barn burner, because this is Glenda Baker, and uh, she's doing some incredibly big things in the industry. She's been in the industry for 30 years now, and uh, she is just expanding and helping so many agents. We talk about a lot of things. We talk about taking over price listings. We talk about real estate coaching. Uh, we talk about, she talks about cold calling. All right, she's a big, huge social media. She believes that if you're not on social media, you're really missing the boat here. We talk about social media for real estate agents, but we also dig into cold prospecting, which I found very interesting coming from her. Uh, we also talked about the state of the market. And if right now is the best time or when the best time to buy a house is, you're really going to enjoy this interview. Go ahead and smash the like button, hit subscribe, comment when you hear something that resonates with you to help that YouTube algorithm. And let's dive right into it. So you said you have a great ability of helping people um, kind of move in the direction of, of their goals, tweaking the few little things, becoming a better version of themselves. It kind of sounds like the definition of a coach. I'm going to yeah. post something on social. This is what I'm doing to build my brand. All of that stuff, I want to see it so there's accountability. And I, I remember I called my mom and I said, did you know that you don't get paid unless you sell a house? Like, I thought this was a real job. Like, I, I thought yeah. somebody was going to give me a paycheck. How people live in their house. How people consume content. What's important to people. Expectations. And those things in the real estate community had really not changed a ton. The only reason that you're scared is because you don't have clarity and certainty. Number one, clarity and certainty comes with predictability. What are you doing in your business that is predictable, that creates predictable results? It's a good time to buy a home if you find the product that you want and the location that you want at the price that you're willing to pay. Hello. Good morning. How are you? Good. How you doing? Just living the dream, selling houses every day, same as always. Mm, I hear you. No, it's uh, it's cool because you're doing so many things. It seems like, anyway, from the outside looking in. I am. I am moving and grooving. That is for sure. I'm headed to New York tomorrow, and then Iowa next week, and then Austin. So you are correct. There's Just um. Just speaking, speaking engagements. So Tyler Whitman is opening the agency Hampton. And so I'm going up for all of the festivities for that this weekend. Mm -hmm. And then I speak in Iowa, my first Glenda continuing education course. And then uh, Austin, I am actually a participant. So, okay, yeah. So I'm not speaking. I'm just going there to get smarter better to learn it's more brendan bouchard you probably yeah. know him. uh-huh yeah. yeah what 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 does he teach like i know him i've seen him i you know i know he writes books and he talks about certain things but like what is he what is his thing well i'm not exactly sure i think it's more of a speaking um like learning to be a better speaker mm. uh leader it's more of a leadership kind of conference and so I'm, you know, the speaking thing is really fun. I love it because I get to see all of like my friends and the people that, that follow me and they're like, oh wait, she's really real. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I like that part of it. And I also like helping agents, you know, helping agents, yeah. you know, get better. Mm -hmm. What, uh. Well, I mean, <laughs> for one, everybody listening, like I've got the phenomenal Glenda Baker here. If you don't know her, then yeah, she's been trending for a while now. So, <laughs> um, yeah, you're you're doing a whole lot of things. So, like with the like speaking and traveling and helping agents and stuff like that. Like, what do you envision with that side? Because you're still in production. Yes. And then you spend a lot of time traveling and speaking and helping other agents and stuff like that. Are you getting into like the education side of the business? Are you trying to transition into being like half agent, half coach? Are you doing it for fun? Like, I'm sure people want to know, like, what are you doing? Well, I can't imagine being a coach just because 
if Susie didn't do what I told her to do, that would annoy me. And I would feel like that she was wasting her time and mine. So I don't know that coaching is the right uh, kind of like space or venue for me. I am really um, bullish on masterminds, group masterminds. And I really feel like where there's like a sharing environment, like I'm not just the one talking where there's people like spitballing ideas and you kind of get the opportunity to unpack them and refine them. That is probably my comfort zone. Maybe my lane of genius is bringing out the best in people, helping them improve or tweak just a little bit to be the best version of themselves. So I think that the the group mastermind is probably the direction that I'm moving. I have a, a, a I don't want to say it's a course, but I definitely have a group mastermind starting September the 6th where uh, it's it's a group small groups, intimate groups, because I think that those are a little bit easier to manage. And uh, we're going to learn about social media, building your brand, farming, sphere of influence. So it's really kickstarting your real estate career. It's really designed for uh, the first steps of being a great real estate agent. And people will pay to do this? Yeah. There's a cost to it. It's a 12-week program, and it's, I want to say... I don't know, maybe it's twelve hundred dollars for the first for the first X number of seats. And then it kind of graduates up as we as it gets a little bit bigger. But small groups, uh, ten and under, and it'll almost be like elementary, high school, college, master's degree. So because you can't put the person who's been in real estate three months in the same group as the person who's been in real estate ten years. Um, There's just different goals, you know, a lot of like team building and stuff like that. So I'm really being conscientious of how everybody is kind of grouped together. And so right now we're focusing on uh, kickstarting your real estate career. So like vetting them really good in the beginning, like what's your production, what's your goals, blah, 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 like a lot of upfront information about their business and stuff. And then you take that and kind of group, you know, pair them up with whatever group you think that they, you know, would most you know, connect with. Yeah. A hundred percent because, you know, one of the questions that I ask, whether it's a buyer or a seller or an agent that is coming to me is in a perfect world, what does the experience with me look like? So Mm -hmm. tell me what it, in your head, what do you have visualized? Because first off, it's going to tell me kind of where you are. It's going to tell me if I can figure out how to meet you where you are. And it's also going to tell me if I can move you forward from where you are. Mm-hmm. So um, that that's my question. That's my, my first question for just about any task that I start is in a perfect world. What does the experience with me look like and go from there? And if I can, if I can fulfill what their expectation is, I know that it's going to be a great relationship. But I had a lady call me the other day and she uh, wants to sell her house. Highest sale in her neighborhood, her exact same floor plan is $504,000. And she says to me, I think my house is worth six fifty dollars because I have a third car garage. Mm -hmm. I can't bridge the gap between her expectation and the reality of the market. And you and I both know that that's where failure lives. And it's always your fault. It's it's mm-hmm. never anybody else's fault. It's always you, the real estate agent. So I knew off the bat that it was going to be difficult to uh, meet her expectations. So we wished her the best of luck and um, hope that she finds a real estate agent that, you know, is Houdini. Mm-hmm. So with the... Uh... With doing that, is the is is it like kind of like a bluff? Is it kind of like you know you're hoping that they're like, well, wait a minute, don't go away, you know, let's let's talk, or are you uh-huh. just like literally like, see ya, like you yeah. you don't yeah, want to work with her at that point. Well, the thing about it is, people always say, oh, Glinda, you sell all those big houses, Glinda. You know, I didn't send somebody to you because I know you sell those million-dollar houses. I sell anything, $150,000 to $9 million. I select 
the people that I work with based on my ability to enjoy them. And if you're going to be a pain in the neck at a $5 million house is no different to me if you're going to be in the pain in the neck on a $500,000 house. So I really, I really enjoy working for people who believe in me, believe in my skill set, and who listen to me. Because just like Susie comes into a coaching course that I'm coaching and she doesn't do what I tell her to do, I've already proven, I have the track record, that she should do what I'm telling her to do. And if she's not going to do it, then why am I going to waste my time or hers? Same exact thing with the buyer and the seller is if I'm not going to be able to bridge that gap between expectation and reality, why kill myself? And what will happen is first law of second wife, third real estate agent. That lady will find an agent who will list it for $650,000 and she'll get frustrated. I guarantee you she'll fire that agent in 30 days. She'll go on to the next, and that person will take it overpriced as well. And then by the time she gets to me, again, she will have understood the reality of the market. And I'll get it where it's supposed to be priced, and she'll be thankful that she worked with me. And what's the house worth? How overpriced are we talking? Well, the last sale in the throes of the best market that we've ever experienced in our lifetime was 504 Okay. And she wants six fifty and she paid three twenty two mm-hmm. mm-hmm. three years ago. Yeah. Now I see it all the time, honestly. Um one thing I struggle with and struggle with is like a new agent, like midway through my career and stuff. I would I would tell sellers a price that was reality. They didn't like it, you know, and they're like, Okay, we'll think about it. And the next thing I know it's just listed for yeah. what they for what they wanted. And then it goes under contract. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, crap. Right. And so then I started to get into the mindset like, okay, let me do my best to bring to bridge that gap. But if I can't bridge the gap, I'm going to list it because if I don't, someone else is, it's going to go pending. And I'm going to say, I could have had that. Right. So that that, that became my thinking. And, And what happened was, The seller either, you know, they start high. I set expectations. I'm like, this is not going to happen. They're like, well, I just want to do it. Okay, great. I want to help you do what you want to do. And then what happens is if they, this tells me they're either A, not motivated. They don't really care if it sells or not. Or they are motivated. They just want to try it. And what normally happens is if they are motivated, they need to sell it. They want to sell it. They're going to reduce that price. That's always a bad move because now... You've lost the the eyeballs of the new listing. You're, you know, you've lost the momentum of of it. And I kind of warned them of that in the beginning as well. So I go over all this in the beginning, like how much of a bad move this really is. But at the end of the day, I don't really ever. I got to where I did. I didn't turn down the overpriced listings. And I'll tell you, I sold so many like things that I think will sell in a day never sold, and things I thought would never sell sold in a day. Right. It happened so many times. And I got to where I was like, I don't really want this overpriced listing, but I know that some magic is going to happen and it's going to sell. And if I don't take it and approach it as here's the expectations, let me help you do what you want to do. I was really trying to nail down the relationship long term. I would. I would secure a relationship with everyone, even if they were a pain in the net, because I was numb to it. Like it didn't bother me if they were they were a pain in the neck you know what I mean I just got to where it just it just I just let it roll off I wouldn't answer my phone sometimes for those people every single time they called you know because I knew they were going to talk forever or cuss me out so um I just didn't care so I you know you know uh, I think that that's such um the just complete observation I think that that is a a difference in um, where you are. Like you're still you're still uh, in that mode of uh, conquering all of the people. Mm-hmm. Where maybe I'm a little bit more uh, look. I don't want to say tired, but I'm little. I'm a little bit more reluctant. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
to give my time to the difficult people. Maybe yeah. because I'm happy. Maybe because I feel like I have less time left than you. <laughs> well, um, back in March of last year, I pretty I'm like 99% out of production. My dad handles the day to day. I'm just doing this and you know traveling, speaking, coaching, writing, creating content, everything else. And, um, and so, you know, trust me, like at this point, I don't want anybody (laughs) like, you know, like everybody says, I love sales, never going to quit selling until the day they're like cringing every time a client calls and they're, and they're just doing the job half ass. And that, that's where I got to. Um, I just wasn't, it wasn't fun anymore all of a sudden, you know, and like, that might be where you are. You just maybe have a little better, um, like you, 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 you know, I gave up. I'm like, here, here, dad, you do it. I'm going to go over here. Of course, I could have quit selling a lot earlier, but it sounds like you're in the stage, like kind of where I am, but you're still willing to go out and sell stuff. You're just really selective because you are traveling, you are speaking, you're creating these small groups and stuff like that. Was there a time in your career where you were trying to capture everyone like in the building years is this something you got to or are you always like this yeah i mean i uh i i was i had a a stage of my career where i wanted to get everything Mm -hmm. and then i think that uh i probably had that one too many um people that were just very very difficult and it and, and as i said It's not that I'm tired. I love, I wake up every single morning excited to be a real estate agent. I love helping people, you know, achieve the American dream, buy and sell real estate, learn how to invest in real estate. I love that part of the business. What I don't love is people being difficult and bad behavior. And so I try and insulate myself uh, from those people, just because the quality of my life is so much more important to me these days. Um, but yeah, I mean, of course, there was there was that time when I was building, and you know, interestingly enough, I remember when I listed uh, Heinz Ward's house, and he wanted to list it at five and a half million dollars. Had been on the market for two years, and uh, it, it was still. Don't tell me you turned Heinz Ward down. Well, it, no, no, no. It was still overpriced at five and a half million dollars. I knew where it should be, uh, and it was still way overpriced at five and a half million dollars. But I was not, under any circumstance, going to walk away from the opportunity to work with Heinz Ward. Yeah. And so I listed that house at five and a half million dollars, and uh, I remember he called me. He goes, "I've got to sell this house. I'm done. I'm over it." I, I I need to unload it. Mm-hmm. And I said, if you want to sell it, you need to price it at three million seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And he did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you're exactly right. You've got to but I knew I was going to enjoy the process with him. I knew he mm-hmm. was going to listen to me. Mm-hmm. And then again, that it was on a busy, fancy street in Atlanta. And mm-hmm. from that listing, I got a three and a half million dollar listing around the corner. So I I think that experience gives you the ability to discern uh, when the risk of taking that overpriced listing or taking that person who's maybe a little bit more difficult than others um, is worth it uh, because the reward and the payout uh, kind of offsets the crazy. Yeah. No, I've just... You're exactly right. Like the experience to be able to know how to tackle those situations. I think the problem is new agents are just taking taking over price listing, and they almost tell the seller, "Oh, we'll have no problem selling this." You know, yeah. I yeah. think that's where it kind of starts to become an issue. Yeah. Um, going back to the small groups thing. So, so you said you have a great ability of helping people um, kind of move in the direction of of their goals, tweaking the few little things, becoming the better version of their self. It kind of sounds like the definition of a coach. Yeah, it, it does. And, and, but I think that the ability to kind of spitball in the group with mm-hmm. the facilitator. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're going to have, so you're not going to be the facilitator necessarily in the small group. No, I, I am absolutely the facilitator. 
Okay. I am okay. a facilitator and I'm bringing in people who are, I'm bringing in agents across the country that their skill set is social media. Their skill set is farming. Their skill set is brand. Their skill set is SOI. And so it's not just me. It really is a small group mastermind. Mm. And, um, and we're billing it as uh, Glenda Growth Groups. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I want, because this is the thing, is that maybe the way I'm thinking about it, just like you talked about how you would have handled an overpriced listing uh, versus how I would handle an overpriced listing. I want Bobby and Susie and Julie and Joni and John to have the benefit of your expertise and mine. Uh -huh. And maybe, maybe, you know, John's experience in South Carolina is different from Christina's experience in Florida. Mm -hmm. And so I really think that it's that it, that the riches are in the group mm -hmm. and, and spitballing it, unpacking it, and then tweaking it and figuring out a way that you can take it and adapt it to your market and your business model and explode your business model. That yeah. that really is my deal. Because what works for John in South Carolina may not work for Christina in Florida. Mm -hmm. Is the is the twelve hundred dollars for a year? Is it for a month? Is it for oh, weeks. okay. Oh, so three three months. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. It's a great value. Um and I think it's a great idea. Is anyone else doing this type of um I don't think anybody else is doing it like this, where it's like small group, bring in experts, let people hear different sides, uh, collaborate within their selves. I mean, I don't think anybody's doing it to this level. Groups of 10, you know, yeah. so, it sounds unique. Well, I just, to me, what I, like you and I both know, we've, I'm sure that we've both been in group settings where there were 25 or 50 people and the same five people were the ones who, you know, took the majority of the time. Yeah. And what I, what I like about a small group, and really the idea kind of came to me from my church, because yeah. I have a huge church, I go to a huge church, mm -hmm. and um, they really talked about that change and connection happens in a small group. And, I, and that really kind of resonated with me. And I just kind of thought back to different environments I had been in, different environments I had been exposed to. And there was one person leading the conversation. And if I didn't agree with that person or if I wasn't getting what that person was saying, it, it was worthless to me. Mm. Also, there were so many people I didn't have a chance to say, okay, here's my, my situation. How do I handle that? And so that's why I thought, I, I know the best agents in the country. I mean, all over the country, I know them. And I know them, their cell phone to pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, will you come and guest with us? And I don't think there's a lot of people who have the ability to facilitate something like this. And I think that it's a great value. And, and it also is like a passion project for me because if I just take 10 people at a time and make our industry better, then it weeds out the riffraff yeah. and we're just better as a group. And that's really where I think that we need to be. Yeah, that's really cool. Our, our, the church we go to city hope, um, they, they do the same thing. They have small groups. They get people in small groups. They do the small group sessions. They're really big on small groups. And, um, so I've been, I've been a witness of the same thing in the church we go to. Um, so I know exactly what you're talking about and I never really thought about it because, you know, we've, they've been doing that for a long time. I never really thought about that, you know, in our space, you know, to bring that here and to try to where did you do the small groups at your church? Did, yeah. Where, yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing is like, you would set your intention. And again, that goes back to, in a perfect world, what does this experience look like to you? So setting your intention and then understanding the expectation and where do you want to end up after 12 weeks? So really just those three things is the foundation 
and then being able to help everyone just get better and better and better and better. And plus, I think that there is power in proximity. And by bringing in the best agents in the country to talk about what their specialty is, I, I, I think that there is value in John in South Carolina being able to turn around and pick up the phone and call Susie in Sarasota, who's built a team of 50 agents. Mm. Isn't it amazing, like, how small the, the world is now? Yes, it is. I mean, you, 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 I mean, like when I started in 02, um, I mean, this, none of this, like there, we didn't even have, like, we were, it was still flip. There was no a phone apps. There was no, there was nothing like there was no Zillow. There was barely MLS. There was no electronic signatures. There were no, there was no social media or anything. Um, like literally you, you aren't only confined to the agents in your local market to try to learn from unless you like went to a seminar somewhere um you know where you might meet someone that you could get their phone number and call them or something but you were almost confined to only the agents in your office wherever you were to really kind of learn from you know and now it's just like there's so much connection between agents all over in different markets and everything, um, you know, like that have become like really close friends and collaborating and sending referrals. Um, it's really amazing um, when you really sit and think about how far all this has come. And we were talking about this. I, I have a clubhouse room every Wednesday from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Central. What else? Yeah, Clubhouse, it's a ass. It's still something. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm there on Wednesday, every Wednesday. How many people go to your Clubhouse? Uh, mm-hmm. We cycle through about 300 people in that hour. Yeah. Uh, we hold it. Wow. It stays at about 90 to 100 people. Every wow. Week. And clo- again, so, and, and this is probably crazy, but I like to look at a host of things. And then I pick out and choose what I think is the most valuable part of it. And then I create, I glendify it to work for whatever I want to do. So I'm in church. I'm hearing about the small group. I'm on Clubhouse. And the topic that I brought up this week was, you know, uh, Robert Refkin with Compass is really pushing this four by four uh, initiative, four hours a day, four days a week in the office. You've got mm-hmm. all of these large corporations trying to get everybody back in the office. Yeah. In the in real estate, brokerages are not doing that. In fact, right. they're unloading office space as fast as they can. Mm-hmm. And what's happened is, you know, when I started in the business, when Jesus was a baby 30 years ago, you know, you got, I listened to Murray Park. And I sat outside of her office and I listened to everything she said. I was around the water cooler with Barbara Oliver. I was around the water. And who are these? These are these are agents in your office. These were the best agents in my office. Murray was the number one agent in the board, and she happened to be in my office. Barbara Oliver was in the top three in the board, and she happened to be in my Mm -hmm. office. And I had the opportunity to be around those people. Today, if I was just starting. At the real estate Taj Mahal, which is what it was called because it was this huge office building, there's nobody in there except the office admin. That's it. Mm-hmm. Nobody goes into the office. And yeah. I think that there's this ability and this need to mm-hmm. create these water cooler, small group, mastermind uh, environments to really, um, you know, change on the industry and there's enough agents that want it Uh, there's no doubt there's a it's a huge 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 like everybody every agent i talk to they're like i want more collaboration i want to be around you know higher producers i want to you know i want to collaborate and talk to 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 other people um i'm the same way i've got a a big office here in gulf shores and um i i've got about 40 agents locally 
and none of them go to the office. I'm literally buying a smaller office to put my admin in and I'm going to rent the big office out for like four or five grand a month just because it's sitting there not being used. I bought it three years ago so that office, so that agents could use it, a nice conference room and everything. And I'm like, I'm losing five grand a month, you know, with that. Nobody's using it. So I'm buying a smaller office. I'm downgrading um, and then going to rent the big one out so I can <laughs> make some money on it. So, But you're not um, downgrading. You're right-sizing. You're yeah, right-sizing yeah. based on the needs of yeah. your agent population. And I think that 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 what people what in and what what big brokerages are really missing the boat is the brokerage agnostic element of a small group um and again right. i go, i go back to church where you know i would never ever have the chance to meet Susie and sandy springs in the 10,000 seats at the church but in a small group I can meet Susie in Sandy Springs and she may be my same age and my same stage of life. And that is somebody that gives me that intimate connection. And yeah. that, that's what people are, are, are just absolutely starved for is real connection. Yeah. And think about it. I mean, you know, you're doing coaching. People want to be close to you. Because they feel like that that gives them the proximity to power. It gives them the proximity to knowledge. And 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 they're looking for that connection from you. And I think that when you do it in a small group, it's even more intimate and more rich. Mm. Yeah, this is good stuff. So how often are you going to get together? Is it going to be on Zoom? Once a week. Once a week. And it is um, it's uh, an hour. And okay. it is 15 minutes of ask me anything, 30 minutes of, of, of what we're talking about, what we're focused on, what our intention is. And then that other 15 minutes is to say, okay, how are you going to take what we talked about today and how are you going to implement it? Because what I find, I know for myself I go to Tom Ferry, I get tons of ideas, I write in my notebook, I take my notes, and I never ever open them up and look at them again, and I never implement anything. And that is something that I am absolutely 1000% going to get past with the people who are with me. I want 30 minutes of instruction, I want 15 minutes of how you're going to implement it, and I want 15 minutes of ask me anything. So ask me anything in the beginning. Yep. 30 minutes of training. Yep. 15 minutes of, okay, tell me how, tell me what you got out of this and tell me how you're going to implement it tomorrow. Right. Um, and then there's accountability because they're going to have to show their work. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you're going to be able to bullshit me. Oh, I'm going to send out a postcard. No, 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 no. I want to be on the mailing list. I want to see the postcard that you sent out. I'm going to yeah. post something on social. This is what I'm doing to build my brand. All of that stuff, I want to see it so there's accountability. And the thing about it is, is that, is that, and, and, and you may be too young to remember this, but when I was in school, you had to show your work. If you didn't show your work, it was almost like you cheated or you didn't do it. So that's why I think that this show your work. I mean, do they not have to show their work in school now? What are you saying? I don't, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if they do or not, for God's sakes. It's been so long since I've been in school. I'm, okay. I'm going to burst into flames if we went into it. Um, I barely got out of it and I damn sure I'm not going back, but I think that the, I think that the show your work segment of the small group, yeah, it, it holds you accountable. And I think that you're better, um, when you're, when you're telling other people what you're going to do, it's almost like you feel bad if you didn't do it. Yeah. No, I, um, it seems like. Um, with, I mean, I would imagine you're going to sell tons of these. And so then start, what's, what starts going through my mind is, is how's Glenda going to keep up with 200 people posting on social, making sure they're posting, getting postcards, all this no, kind of stuff. Just, kind of what I'm not doing 200 people. I, I, I've already kind of, we've built it out. We've kind of thought through steps one and two, three, four, five, mm -hmm. and it is like limited yeah, I, right. I just, 
You only, you can only do so many. Yeah. 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 And again, it's more like, oh, but Glenda, you could take the overpriced listing. It's more about quality of life for me. And so are people going to have to apply? And then yeah. you're actually, you may even turn people down and yeah. apply? 100%. Okay. Because that's just the thing is that, is that, you know, when you ask somebody, what is the, per, in a perfect world, what does the experience with me look like? It, some people just don't have a reasonable expectation. Mm. And yeah. they're, they're somewhere between reasonable and rational. Mm -hmm. No problem for me. I can deal with reasonable. I can even deal with rational. What I can't deal with is unrealistic. Mm -hmm. So I just, I want. What's I, an example of unrealistic? Give me an example of just unrealistic. You know, like, are you telling me they want to make a million bucks in a week? Like what, what unrealistic, what do you mean by that? So I think that when I talk about unrealistic, it is the person who thinks that all of this is easy. The person that thinks that, that, that the real estate gods open up the heavens and mm -hmm. the $5 million buyer appears as an angel. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you, you and I both know that that's just not, you've got to put in the reps. How do I, how do you identify that within the application that this well, person I that, is? I think that you tap one, when you talk to people, mm -hmm. you understand what is their intention. Right. And, and it's just like the seller. You, you understand immediately if the, if you have that ability. And I think that sometimes it's just a lack of understanding. When I went through real estate school, I was probably, I was probably four days in and they started talking about commission. Mm. And I, I remember I called my mom and I said, did you know that you don't get paid unless you sell a house? <laughs> like, I, I, I thought this was a real job. Like, I, I thought yeah. somebody was going to give me a paycheck. Right. And I was like, yeah, Pumpkin, you don't get paid. I remember sell. whenever I got my license, I called the broker that uh, I went with, I think. And I was like, do you have a job like me sweeping the floors or something so I could make some kind of paycheck while I'm trying to get this thing going? He's like, no, I don't have anything I can. There's no hourly job that I have for you until you sell something. Yeah. I mean, I went in, I never will forget my first day. I go in on Monday. I'd taken the class the Thursday before. And so on Monday, I got to the office at 10 minutes till nine mm -hmm. and the door wasn't even unlocked. And then nine o'clock, the office administrator comes up, unlocks the door, walks in and I, and I go in, I'm all excited and it's mm -hmm. cold because there's nobody in the office. And I'm like, Carol, where is everybody? She goes, Plenda, it's real estate. It's optional. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't have to be here. Mm -hmm. She goes, nobody cares if you're here or not. I was like, mm -hmm. oh my God. Like, I thought you worked nine to five. But still, even today, I get up, I get dressed, I do my hair, I put my makeup on, I go into my office. Mm -hmm. My team goes into the, into the office. We brainstorm typically in the mornings. And then um, in the afternoons, we have, we disperse for our appointments and then we do it all over the next day. Yeah. So that, so that was 93? 92. So September 4th, uh -huh. September 4th, I will be 31 years. Wow. Wow. So you, so you actually um, did search for properties using the, uh, the monthly uh, book. Mm -hmm. Book, yeah, book. yeah, like, yeah. Like your fingers would get mm -hmm. black because <laughs> of the of the print. Uh -huh. It was like newspaper paper in the book, mm -hmm. and you would like you would flip it. And I remember like these two fingers had like black on them that I could never get off because I was turning the page like that. And uh, <laughs> that's funny that you remember that detail. Oh my gosh. I mean, like I, the first time I got it on me, I was like, what in the world? And sit down. The first computer that I used to search for real estate, there was one, two. There were two in an office of 90 agents, two desktop computers, and it had a green, like, cursor. Like, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and all the letters were green. They still used microfiche when I started hmm. 
to search the like the tax records. It was crazy. And that and and today, like a lot, like I see a lot of agents that have been in it, you know, like me forever. Mm-hmm. And they're literally, they might as well just have a book. Like yeah. they don't know how to use the computer. They don't want to use yeah. the computer. Like they're still selling houses at the country club. They're mm-hmm. still selling houses at the garden club. And it's working for them. Yeah. But I think that this is the thing. And and you you probably see this as much or more than I do, is that it changed from ninety two to two thousand two, mm-hmm. but from two thousand twenty to two thousand twenty three, it was a exponential change. And I think that the people that are not willing to adapt to change, they're not willing to pivot, they're not willing to embrace, happily embrace. Um, I think that those people are literally going to be taken out by the undercurrent. I think that if you are not excited, if you're not embracing technology, how people consume information, content that you put out, um, then I think you're missing the boat. Yeah. You say from 92 to 02, and then were you saying from 02 to 23? Because I think you said 2020, like just over the last three years. Because 02 to 2020... Yeah. I mean, it was, it changed, but nothing that we weren't like prepared for. The biggest thing that happened to, in my head was the real estate downturn of 2008 and then Zillow. Okay. Those were the two biggest things that happened between 2002 and 2020. In 2020, I think that literally the real estate market, and and I, who knows if I, if it, you should say it imploded or exploded and probably a little bit of both. Um, but the way that we do business, we're we talking about estate. submarines looking at the Titanic, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just telling you right now, I think, I, I, I think that the world as we knew it as real estate agents imploded. What do you, what do you, what do you mean by that? Like, I mean, between O2 and 20, you know, all the social media platforms, you know, were born and stuff like that. What, ha- what, what are you talking about specifically 2020 so- to 2023? So I think that I think that what we learned through the pandemic mm. was um, how people live in their house, how people consume content, what's important to people, expectations, and those things in the real estate community had really not changed a ton. Yeah, the biggest thing was that you can get all of the information from Zillow. I mean, think about it. You could get you can go online. Bobby and Susie could search for one, two, three banana street on Zillow, just like I could search for one, two, three banana street in MLS. Yeah. And so that was, that, that changed our industry, but yeah. what really changed our industry and how the foundational ways that we do business changed in 2020. And I think that there are still relics left that have refused to, um, uh, adapt or embrace to that change. But I think that uh, social media, Facebook, Instagram, Clubhouse, LinkedIn, TikTok, um, Twitter, all of these different platforms literally gave me the opportunity. I mean, come on. What's the likelihood that I would have met you before 2020? What's the likelihood that I would have met you before 2015? You probably had no idea. I wasn't even on social media. Yeah. And this is the thing is that, is that you damn sure didn't know who I was with my 122 followers in October of 2020. That's the thing. Social media has given people the ability to be their own news channel, to be their own information channel. Literally. Do you understand? I have more people that watch my videos every week than most nationally syndicated television shows. I have more people that watch my videos a day than attend a Taylor Swift concert. You think that I don't have some sort of influence. I sold a house Monday. The people called me from TikTok, 62 days from TikTok to closing. First time home buyer who bought a house specifically because I said the most conservative and easiest way to make money in real estate is to buy a house sit in it for two years, sell it, buy another one, sit in it for two years. 
that will help you build generational wealth in real estate. And if you have the ability to hold those houses and turn them into rental properties, it's going to help you build it even faster. That girl heard that video. That girl picked up the phone and called me and said, I want to buy a house. And they bought a house 62 days later. They were in an apartment and today they're in a house. Mm -hmm. And that girl never, ever would have found me had it not been for social media. Right. There's a lot of stories like that. Yeah. Do you, do you, did you ever have a, I'm sure you had a coach at one point, you know, yeah. all that good stuff. I Top Ferry. Mm. You've been, yeah. you're still with them? Yeah. Um, how long have you been doing that? 10 years. And you're just like in it to win it. Yeah, because I want to be surrounded by the best people in the business. I, I, yeah. I want to know what is Treasure D Davis doing to build a team of 300 agents? Um, you know, I mean, I want to know, you know, what is Judy Michelis in Connecticut doing to sell average sales price $2 million to sell 100 of those a year? I want to know what are these people doing? And what can I take away from the playbook that they're using and and put it in my own? Mm -hmm. Do you feel like, and you just feel like you need to be in this coaching program to collaborate with them? Could you collaborate with those agents without paying a monthly fee and stuff like that? I think that it's it's easy to say that you can do it without paying but I think that anything that you pay for, you're much more serious about. Mm -hmm. uh, I, what I, about like just instead of paying a monthly fee, just paying to go to these conferences and maybe go to three or four a year and just pay those fees instead of this ongoing? I do you know? I've thought about that. I've mm -hmm. thought about that, and 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 I've also thought about: Am I restricting myself by just coaching in one environment? You know, because there's lots of great coaches and would I learn a completely different uh, method and be exposed to different people if I did coaching with, you know, some uh, Facebook funnel coach or some, you know, militant coach. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I won't say that that's not a possibility. I think that there is an opportunity to uh, learn from many, many people. And it's not just somebody who has the word coach in front of their name. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So what do you think about the market right now? You know, the rates and this and that, and you know, the, I mean, it's kind of a 10 year down, down cycle. We're going to close about the same amount of transactions as 2008. There's a lot of people calling for this massive, you know, price correction and stuff like that which they've been calling for for years and they just keep on saying that it never happens. What, uh, you know, what's your advice to the agents out there who, you know, are kind of like, well, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm kind of scared. The only reason that you're scared is because you don't have clarity and certainty. Number one, clarity and certainty comes with predictability. What are you doing in your business that is predictable that creates predictable results? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that a lot of agents and consumers listen to the news and the news is curated to whatever is the agenda of that news channel. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think that it is so critical for agents to be the true source of real estate information mm -hmm. because if you have a community that is coming to you and is dependent upon you, that is that is the best source. You, you don't know anything about real estate in Cobb County. So mm. so listening to to you know Susie in Sarasota talk about real estate in Cobb County, she doesn't know anything. It goes back to the intimacy of the knowledge. And I think that knowing what is going to happen, nobody knows. If somebody tells you the rates are going up, they don't know that. They no, tell you not at all. Down, they don't know that. That's just, yep. that's anybody's best guess. The mm -hmm. bottom line is, is that people are going to need a place to live. Yeah. Always. Mm -hmm. Period. We're not going to live in a fake mansion 
in the on the computer period you are going to need a place to live as long as i have been selling real estate i have never sold a house in the very height of the market in 2006 the very height of the market in 2022 that is not worth the same or more today mm -hmm. and people and there's this one guy and i you know i think i block people out that annoy me because i can't even remember his name but his he he comment he takes my video chops it up comments on it and he said huh he like takes it and re-edits it and stuff yeah he takes it re-edits it a lot of work puts it in his uh, on his channel and says Jeez. and talks about what a complete and total dumbass i know and his foundation for this is that what do you what are you saying in the video what 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 is what is he what is your message that he's trying to call you out on so these people paid a hundred and thirty seven thousand dollars in 1973 for this house okay, okay. i sold it for eight hundred and eighty five thousand dollars and in this video i'm talking about the appreciation that these people saw yeah. in their hundred and thirty seven thousand dollar investment and in his video he goes yeah but if they bought stock the stock would be worth way more. Okay. Anybody who makes a general statement like that obviously doesn't know what they're talking about because he's 100% right. If those people had taken their $137,000 and bought Apple stock, would mm -hmm. it be worth more? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Netflix? Yeah. But if they bought Blockbuster, Kodak, or Xerox, would it be worth more? No. Mm -hmm. But the factor, the layer, the factor that he doesn't take into consideration is that these people had a place to live. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. the last time I checked, I can't live in my stock certificates. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I can't snuggle up in my bed in my stock certificate. And so mm -hmm. that's the thing is, like, when you make a statement like, oh, well, they would have made more if they had invested in the stock market. Maybe they would have and maybe they wouldn't have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as long as you never put yourself in a position to have to sell, you have a place to live, and most likely you have a home that's going to be worth more than you paid for it. It's that yeah. simple. Yeah. Yeah. He really went to a lot of lengths there. <laughs> and he's done it more than once. And it wow. totally cracks me up. And it's so funny because I was, you know, obviously I was talking shit about him the other day. And I said, I, I'm assuming he takes my videos and chops them up because he doesn't have any followers and he thinks that's going to get him some followers. Yeah. But anyway, I digress. Flattering. Yeah. And you know what? I just look at it this way. I, I'm like, at least somebody else watched my video. How many times did he have to watch? How many views did I get just mm. from that one guy? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then how many views did you get from people that watched his that went over to yours? I went you know? right ahead, bucko. And it's hilarious because you look at the comments in his video and the Glendorotties are all there saying, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know. You didn't listen to the whole story. Glenda, that uh, you cut it up. It's great. I love it. I, I, I love it when I get haters and then all my fans just eat them alive. Yeah. Do, uh, are you, are you more prone to, to, to reply back to a hater comment than, uh, than a fan? Oh, Does no. it does it hit you differently and you're like, oh my God, I got to, that's yeah. not true. And, and you comment or do you, are you more prone to, to, to give praise to the, the people who are giving you positive? Uh, the only people that I respond to are the people who love me. Those yeah. are the people who, who get my time. The people yeah. to the haters, I'll typically pin that comment to the top and, <laughs> and let the Glendorotties just literally take them out. It's hilarious. Oh, oh, that's good. Yeah. That's I good. I put that comment to the top and I and I put up underneath it, what do you think about this? <laughs> oh my God. I'm going to use that. No charge for that tip, Ricky. I'm going to use that. Is now a good time to buy a home? It's a good time to buy a home if you find the product that you want and the location that you want at the price that you're willing to pay. Would you ever buy a house that's not the product you want, that's not in the location that you want, that's not the I price a, you want to pay? I think a lot of people settle, and I think a lot of people 
settled a year ago. I think a lot of people bought whatever they could, and Mm. that has led to the uh, uh, dissatisfaction. And and if you're if you ask me, Glenda, where, where can there's no listings on the market? There's nothing available for sale. I'm telling you right now, if you went back to uh, the spring of uh, or the fall, the fall of 21 or the spring of 22, I'm telling you right now, if you went back to all of 2021 and you went back to the spring of 22, I guarantee you, if you called 50 of those people, I guarantee you there'd be 10 of them that wanted to sell their house because they hate it. I've been saying it for months and months that there's this building demand of people that are locked in their homes that hate it more and more every day. And the number of those people are growing every day. And it's building this historic demand that's, that we don't even know about. Number one, number two, more 33 year olds than we've seen in two decades that want to become homeowners. And my theory is whenever mortgage rates come down, we're going to see inventory hit the market of the trade up sellers but they're going to put one on and take one off. So that's a net even for active listings. We're going to have more transactions, but but even active listings. And then the first time home buyers are going to come in and bring the active listings down even more. Uh, it's going to be like this rush of activity and transactions, and it's going to be glorious. And But we're going to see active listings go from bad to worse. But it's, it's funny you say that because it's something I've been talking about for a while. And um, I just believe it wholeheartedly. And you're right. It, and they they settle for a house. So that creates the situation even more. And then they can't sell it because they bought it at 3.5% interest. You know? <laughs> so I think I think it's like the calm before the storm. And when we get the mortgage rate thing figured out over the next 12, 18, 24 months, whatever, it's just going to be like a, an atomic bomb to the market. And it's going to be have upward pressure on prices. I don't even know that we need to get the interest rate figured out. We need to get, because when I bought my first house, the interest rate was 9%. So I don't think it's as much that we need to get it figured out as much as we need to get people comfortable with that two, three, four percent was never, ever normal. That that was literally an anomaly in the interest rate world that this five, six, seven percent interest rate is um it is more normal mm-hmm. than two, three, four. And I think yeah. that that once we can get that dialogue kind of dialed in and people understand it, then I think that's gonna help, number one. But but let me explain to you. If you bought a house in twenty twenty two or twenty twenty one because you couldn't get into anything no, there was nothing on the market. You'd been in bidding wars. You'd lost five houses and you bought one that you halfway liked. I guarantee you, if your wife complains about the kitchen enough, if your wife complains about the bathroom enough, if your husband complains that there's not a man cave enough, nothing motivates people to sell more than death, divorce, debt, and unrest at home. And I'm going to tell you something right now. I think that people are missing the boat. If you are not calling every single person who bought a house in 2021 and every person who bought a house till May of 2022, I think that you are missing the boat. And at what price are you a seller? Hey, Ricky, it's Glenda Baker. You know, I know that you just bought your house in 2021. You probably love it, but just in case you don't, or let me just ask you a crazy question. At what price are you a seller? Well, talking- Linda, I'm not thinking about selling. Oh, so you're living in your dream home, Ricky? Well, it's not right. my dream home, but I mean, I guess if I could get 700000 I would sell it. So if I had somebody who'd pay you $700,000, you'd sell your house, Ricky? We, well, yeah. Do you have somebody? I don't know. Can I come see your house? And literally, you can do the off-market love connection with, because you know, you, you've probably got 50 buyers who want to buy a house if they could find something to buy. And you literally are creating this off-market pocket inventory that nobody knows about. And we're mm-hmm. all in text groups. Hey, I've got somebody looking in East Cobb in Walton School District. I need something seven to 900000 It needs to have four bedrooms and a backyard. 
everybody's in those text groups. So why are you not, why are you not looking for that off market secret shadow inventory of Bobby and Susie that if they got 700,000 that they would sell it? Easy peasy lemon squeezy. And if more, and again, it goes back to, you got to put in the reps. This, the, the home buying agent, they just don't fall from the sky. You, I mean, literally you've got to find the people who want to buy a house. You got to find the people who want to sell a house. And you're not going to do it by just sitting in your house on Instagram. I, I uh, it brings up something that I said a, a while back that uh, you know our job as agents is to connect buyers and sellers. And what 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 we're doing as the industry is we're, we're just finding the seller and then waiting on another agent to find the buyer, or we're finding the buyer and then we're waiting on another agent to list the pro we're watching MLS every day waiting on another agent to find the seller for the buyer and I'm like if you have a buyer figure out what neighborhood they want and attack to find them the seller this is your job to connect the buyer and the seller you've just you've only done half the job you know you're not you're not you're not completing the process here this you know your job wasn't to find half the deal you know your job is to go out there and find 100% of the deal um are you are are you referencing here to cold call sellers that bought in 2021? So cold calling is not my deal. That's just not my deal. Um, I, I've never been a cold caller except for the 15 weeks I was in Floyd Wickman. Um, and I did, and I cold called, and I won that competition. I did 36 million dollars in 15 weeks. But so I've never been a big cold caller. But what I do love to do is I love to door knock around houses that I list, houses that I get under contract. So I list 123 Banana Street. I like to go to the neighbors and tell them before it goes on the market, hey, I'm going to list 123 Banana Street. If you know of anybody who's looking in your neighborhood, I just hope you'll keep it in mind. I'm going to have it open on Sunday from 2 to 4. If there's anybody who blocks your driveway, just let me know. Here's my contact information. Why don't I just text you my contact card and then that way you'll have it. And I literally get their contact information. Oh, and by the way, do you know anybody else in the neighborhood who's thinking about selling? No, Glenda, I don't know anybody. Let me ask you a question, Ricky. You know, just out of curiosity, at what price would you be a seller? Oh, I'm not, Glenda, I'm going out feet first. Great. And let me give you my card because I want to make sure you give it to your kids so when you go out feet first, they know who to call. <laughs> and so literally, like, when you list it, when you hold it open, when it goes under contract, when they do the inspection, you should be doing 25 of those. 25. 25 okay. minutes with you. Okay? And literally, if you pick, and you can even pick up the phone and call around those 25. To me, those are not cold calls. Those are warm calls. I'm doing a service to let everybody know that I'm putting it on the market, that I'm going to have it open, that it's gone under contract, that we're doing the inspection, that it's sold. And I think mm -hmm. that that is the best opportunity. And you are exactly right. It goes back to that question, in a perfect world, what does the real estate experience look like for you? And then Bobby and Susie say, hey, in a perfect world, we would love to live in Atlanta Country Club. We would love to live on the side of the club. We would love a primary bedroom on the main floor. Okay. They told me exactly what they would love. All I need to do is, is tell everybody that I know in Atlanta Country Club, I've got somebody who's looking for Whose house is that? Like, I know, like in my head, I know I can see it. I just can't remember whose house that is. Oh, Glenda, that's John and Joni's house. One, two, three, one, two, five, Banana Street. Oh, okay. Literally. It's a love connection. It's like match game. It's like yeah. that old game concentration where you would flip over the card and it would say bicycle. And then you would flip over this card and it would say truck. And then you would flip over this card and it would say bicycle. Mm -hmm. Same exact thing. So, and, and that, so you've done a lot of off-market deals. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So have I. Um, w when I think of, when I think of just prospecting like cold, like cold calls and door knocking are kind of always like people say, you know, have you made cold calls or door knock? It's kind of the same thing. It's just what, it's just, it's just, are you calling them or are you knocking on their door? Right. What's your intention? What is your intention? If it's so much easier to go to the golf course 
and want to hit a hole in one, to want to hit the green rather than going to the golf course and not knowing what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm looking for a house for Bobby and Susie. You have a purpose. Bobby and Susie, you want three bedrooms, two baths. You have an intention. You know what you're looking for. You have clarity. You have certainty. They want to live in East Cobb. They want to live in Atlanta Country Club. Mm -hmm. When you have clarity and certainty, give people confidence and make them comfortable to make a decision to act. And that is what everybody needs, whether it's a buyer, seller, or real estate agent. When you have certainty and clarity, it gives you it makes you comfortable enough to have confidence to make a decision and to act. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so is, <laughs> so is cold calling the same as door knocking? It's just in person yeah, versus on the car. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, in, 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 in essence, you're, I mean, you're, you, you know, you know, social media, but also like get out and meet people you haven't met before, like knock on their doors, call them, do whatever you got to do. Right. Yeah. So, I always say like the most dangerous agent is the one that uses old school, which I refer to cold prospecting as old school, even though it's not, yeah, no, but like people classify it. And uh, if you can combine, cause most people are just social media or they just do cold prospecting. And it's like, mm -hmm. if you would combine these two and just do cold prospecting and, and follow up and all that, just stay talking to people all morning and then do really concentrate on social media all afternoon, you know, you're the most dangerous agent. Three to five years of that, you're the number one agent, you know, in the market. Everywhere. Yeah, yeah. It's true. And, you know, this is the thing is, like, be in the community. Be at the dry cleaners. Be, I mean, take the Jesse Itzler lunch class. I mean, mm -hmm. no lie. All I say all the time, people who sit at the bar want to chat. People who don't want to chat sit at a table by themselves. Okay. If somebody's sitting at a bar to have lunch at a nice restaurant in your community mm -hmm. and you sit down next to them. Hey, is this seat taken? No, nobody's sitting here. Oh, thank you so much. How are you today? I'm wonderful. How are you? Uh, I have been showing houses all day long. Oh, you're in real estate. I am in real estate. Mm -hmm. oh, I have, I have got people standing in line to buy houses in Walton school district. Please tell me, you know, somebody who wants to buy a house. Mm -hmm. Like, you literally just started a real estate conversation. You hadn't even gotten your water yet. And, and now you're turning it around where, you know, you're, you're, you're coming at them with distress, right. you know, and now they just naturally want to help you. They just say, it's like you're choking to death. They <laughs> want to help you. And so, and it, then you start talking about it. And, and if you're sitting in your community, you know, I tell new agents all the time, show five, preview five houses a day, five days a week. That way, when you sit down at the bar next to somebody, you can say, you live in the area? Yeah, I live in the area. Do you know, I just showed this, I just saw this house, 123 Banana Street. You know, it's in Indian Hills. Oh, I, yeah, I live in Indian Hills. Well, of course you live in Indian Hills. It has 1,600 houses. The likelihood that you live in Indian Hills and you're at the restaurant that's right next door to it, I have a feeling. I just, you know, I just saw 123 Banana Street. And, you know, it's got some distinctive colors. You can tell that they were definitely LSU people because mm -hmm. everything in the house is purple. All of a sudden, you have, you have built yourself as an expert because you know the inventory. Mm -hmm. Nothing accelerates credibility faster than proof. And so when you sit down next to a complete and total stranger and you start talking shop in that manner, it's not that you're being salesy. You're literally mm -hmm. creating proof that you are a working real estate yeah. agent. And I wish I knew this kind of stuff, the kind of stuff that we're talking about day one, because I was scared to go talk to people. I was scared to call my sphere of influence day one because I didn't want to come off salesy and I didn't want, I didn't want it to be weird at Thanksgiving. Oh, Ricky's going to try to sell me a house or something like that. I didn't know how to communicate in a way that wasn't, you know, me trying to get them to do something, you know? Um, but I always, I, I always think about it, Ricky, like that Uncle Bob beats me. Like, yeah. Like, I, I Not never. Not you do, right? In the beginning, you didn't, right? Well, you know, it's funny because I read How to Develop a Six-Figure Income in Real Estate from Mike mm -hmm. Ferry. And mm -hmm. in the book, he says, call every person that you know and ask them if they want to buy a house or sell a house. Either one is fine. 
And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And did you feel awkward doing it though? Um, I felt a little bit weird to start with, but then five people listed their house with me and I was like, oh, this is good. And so it's funny because nobody would hire me. I actually interviewed as an assistant and nobody would hire me as an assistant. And I went to the real estate Taj Mahal, the biggest real estate office in Atlanta. And I went to the broker, made an appointment with her and I, and I said, hey, look, you know, I've interviewed with three different people to be a real estate assistant and nobody will hire me. And she goes, why won't they hire you? And I said, well, one person didn't hire me because I was too bubbly. The other people didn't hire me because they didn't want to train their competition. And the third person, they just thought that I was a, I was just going to be difficult. And I was like, can you imagine such things? She goes, no. And I said, but I've got these five listings and I don't have anywhere to work. Can I work for you? And she goes, you've got five listings. I said, yeah, I read this book. <laughs> I developed six figure income in real estate. It said to do this. I did that. And I got five listings. She goes, you're hired. Mm, yeah. So earlier you talked about you like to help people learn how to you know, invest in real estate. And you did this TikTok about, hey, you can buy a house, live in it for two years, you know, no taxes. When you sell it, flip it into another house, live there for two years, on and on and on. Do you feel like there's a lack of education to real estate agents about how to invest themselves into real estate? Do you know, nobody ever talked to me about buying real estate. No, mm -hmm. Nobody ever talked to me. Nobody ever said you should buy real estate. I thought you said I, I, I had no idea and I never, ever will forget. I was going to sell Heather and John house off market, $72,000. And we got five days before closing and they got cold feet. It, it was going to be their first investment property mm -hmm. and they got cold feet. And I did not have the heart to tell the seller uh, he was selling his dad's house. I saw, and I, and I went to him and I said, Hey, I said, the people who, uh, are under contract are getting cold feet. Uh, what if I step in and buy it? And, uh, he goes, will you pay the same amount? I said, yep, I'll pay the same amount. And so I stepped in, I bought that house, I fixed it up and I sold it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then again, I had another client under contract on a house and he's like, you know, Glenda, I just don't have a good feeling about it. And I said, I said, that's fine. So I just called the agent and I said, Hey, I said, my people don't have a good feeling. I said, but I, I'll buy it. I'll meet this. I'll do the same terms that they are. Mm. And I bought that house. And so I, I really kind of got into it. Um, not really thinking clearly, but I mean, I think about the people that I sold, I think about Wagner. I sold him five houses, $210,000 worth of houses, five different houses worth a total of $210,000. Mm -hmm. I made $6,000 and those five houses today are worth $2 million. Right. Right. And I never, it never crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. to and that's the other thing. That's the other thing I want real estate agents, young real estate agents to understand mm -hmm. is Look at every single deal for you as the buyer. Like every time you go on a yeah. list of appointment, look at it is, oh, wait, would I buy this house? Mm -hmm. And that really is such a golden opportunity. Yeah. I'm really pushing it right now um, and have been for about a year. Just, uh, you know, because, you know, I run polls and it's like well over half of agents don't even have a rental property and uh, they don't even think about it. It's like, you know, coaches, like even your coaching program and brokers, it's like the horizon is to be the number one agent. Yeah. You know, it's like, that's the only thing that they're folk. And that was me too. I was just focused on that. Did I buy a couple of rental properties along the way? Sure. But now I realize like I'm very aggressive now. I'm buying houses every single month. Um, and now, I, 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 I can I can visualize in 20 years having $150 million worth of properties, you know, paid off. Um, not hard to do, right? Um, just have a plan over the next five years to acquire a certain amount and boom. But like, 
we were talking about earlier, you know, your business has kind of changed where you're maybe taking, you're more selective on your clients. My business has changed. I've handed over the day to day to my father. We all get to this point where it's like, okay, I, you know, this is great, but every time I make a sale, I have to go out and do it again and again yeah. and again. There's nothing yeah. passive about it except for the residual business you get that you still have to service. Right. It's, well, I'm trying to get agents to realize as much as you love sales, there's going to come a day where you don't. I promise you. <laughs> yeah. And you can't I love going up and down the building it. You yeah. can't wait till then to start building the the the, the portfolio. You got to start, you know. Just make a goal to buy one house a year for the next 10 years or something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm always, and, and you made an interesting, you said, hey, Glenda, you know, do you think it's a good time to buy? You just said you're buying houses every month. Mm -hmm. And and we're great real estate agents. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, we're, we're, we're at the top of our industry and we're buying. So obviously we believe in the product. Are you actively building you know, do you have a nice portfolio that you're actively? Uh, I have a, I, I have a small portfolio. I have short, short term rentals and I love short term rentals. That's my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I only buy something that in a, in a worst case scenario, um, that the short term rental ordinances changed in the mm -hmm. community, I can mm -hmm. flip it into a long term rental, no problem. But I've, I've written, um, one, two, three, four, five offers on properties and there's a little pocket that I like um and I've written five offers and I haven't gotten any of them so oh, somebody right. somebody do you know waiving the due diligence that that has been the thing that has killed me I've agreed to pay the same price I've agreed to pay cash oh you're losing to multiple offers oh I'm losing to multiple offers and there are yeah there are uh and we're not talking two offers we're talking nine 15 20 offers and um, so if this is a down market okay we're going into the fall yeah. all right which traditionally uh softens yeah uh interest rates are hitting you know 20 year highs mortgage applications are down to 92 levels back when you started in real estate okay yeah. we're down to 2008 number of transactions and you're still seeing 20 offers so yeah. so when the market so when the market rebounds Okay. Well, are we going to go to 40 offers, uh, 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 a listing there? You know, I, th I, I think that people don't understand that there are still people in the market. And if you're, if you've listed your house and you're not getting offers, is it because of the pricing condition, location, the product? What is the reason you're not getting offers? Because there is damn sure a lot of people still in the market. And, you know, for me, I don't ever waive the due diligence. I just, I, I just don't ever do that. And I guess, and I was thinking. You're talking about inspections, financing, yeah. you know, those kind of things. Well, I, I'm, I've waived the appraisal and the financing, but mm -hmm. I don't want to waive the due diligence. And this last one that I lost, I had a three day due diligence. Like literally, mm -hmm. I just want Donnie to go over. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. telling me it's not eaten up with mold and it's not yeah. into the ground. That's all right. And uh, literally, I lost it because the person did zero due diligence. Right. So, right. Same price, same terms. Yeah. They had zero well, what did you do if you were the seller and you had the same price, same terms, yeah. one with no due diligence, oh. one with due diligence? All day, every day. So I'm trying to figure out a, way, a workaround for that because, because, of course, they want to leave it on the market for X number of days and get all the offers that they can. And I was thinking to myself, I saw that property on Thursday. They didn't accept an offer until Monday. I could have gotten Donnie over there to you get me to go over there and look at it with you before and, the death. And it would have been worth the $300, $500 for him right. to do it, for me to get the house and waive the due diligence. Yeah. So you live and you learn. Teller would have had to flip a coin though. You know, he, I mean, he had two identical offers, so you, there's still a 50-50 there. Yeah, but I mean, it's just, you never, ever know. You never, yeah. ever know. But you're buying properties, I'm buying properties. Anybody mm -hmm. who's saying, you know, I'm going to sit, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait till the rates go down, wait till prices go down. I'm just telling you right now, you're going to be, you're going to be waiting a long time. Because I, I, I think personally myself, 
I, I think that when it's the right product at the right price in the right location, people are going to buy. And my favorite time to buy is Halloween to New Year's Day. Mm, that's a good tip. Yeah, I, I love, love, love Halloween to New Year's Day. I will buy anything and everything. I love that time of the year. Uh, it's the best time to, I think between Halloween and, and New Year's Day this year is going to be the, the best time. Okay. You know, like it, when you look at the next 10 years, you're going to see this 2023 Halloween and New Year's being the absolute, be really last year, to be honest with you, yeah. between Halloween and New Year's yeah. was, was the best, best yeah. time to buy over the next 10 years, but that's gone. We can't go back. This Halloween, between Halloween and New Year's, is going to be the time I'm really going to be getting even more aggressive than than I am now. Um, I think that uh, the people that have been waiting, I think they're sitting around and they're incredibly disappointed because they they thought that it was going to crash last year. Yeah. Right? And it did a little bit. Like, there was a small correction, but then they thought the big correction is going to come in 2023, and now we hit all-time highs again, and... Uh, now the market's softening and it's like, okay, here's your chance. Like, what are you waiting on now? You know, we're down to just 10 multiple offers per property. <laughs> it's not going to get down to five. But you know what happens when you sit on the sidelines, when you sit on the bench, when you sit on the sidelines, you get muscle atrophy and you're not ready to jump. You're not ready to jump into the market. You're not ready to move Yeah. when the opportunity presents itself. Yeah. That's why personally myself, I think anybody, we've got a client, sweet first time home buyer, sweet couple, and they're in the market. They've made a couple of offers. They haven't gotten it. They're super conservative. And they're like, yeah, we're just going to wait. You know, we're just going to take a step back. We're going to renew our lease and we're going to, we're just going to wait. And I'm thinking to myself, you are, number one, taking yourself out of the market where there's the best opportunity for you to get a house. Mm -hmm. And number two, you're going to be sitting on the sidelines. The bench, you're going to be a bench warmer. When it's time for you to come into the game, you are going to be stiff and you are not going to be prepared for what it's going to take next spring. So I think, I think next spring is going to be, I think, it, I think it'll be crazy. Bonkers. But we're just two real estate agents trying to pump yeah. the market up. I know. That's me and you. That's right, because we don't have any good sense. You know, we're just trying to sell houses and make that commission. Yeah. <laughs> what What is the future for you? Like, like, you know, you're doing all this stuff. Like, you've been doing this for 30 years. Now you're getting into creating small groups and traveling and speaking and all this and that. Um, You know, what what's your, what's your big goals what are you what are you trying to do with this do you just love what you're doing you don't really know or you know I'm, I'm here to impact inspire and inform people and whatever that takes on um you know I think that I would be limiting myself if I said oh I want to do this or oh I want to do that for me I am looking for the opportunity to impact inspire and inform not the most amount of people, but but with the most amount of significance. Uh -huh. And how does that look? Uh, is it a television show? Is it more content creation? Is it more stages to speak on? Um, probably all of the above. For me, I, I I'm really looking for freedom. Um, and the ability to do whatever I want to do to me, that is the ultimate luxury is the freedom to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Um, uh, but I, I want to leave, I want to leave a legacy, a legacy for my kids, uh, of a real estate portfolio. And I want to leave a legacy in our industry that, I uh, inspired somebody. I helped them get into the business. I helped them, their business to get better. Um, and all of the people that I help to buy and sell. Um, you know, I think about the co little couple that I helped on Monday that she's 23, he's 28, first time home buyers. And, you know, I helped them achieve the American dream. I changed their life on Monday. Mm -hmm. 
And that means a lot to me. So I'm, I, I want to figure out how, how, how is, how can I have the biggest impact? And if that is making real estate agents better 10 at a time, then that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Well, I love what you're doing and I think you're doing a fantastic job and, um, and I appreciate you for, for that and trying to make the world a better place. I'm on the same mission. So can people, is there a place where this will probably come out a week or two after we actually, after today, actually. So is there a place people can go apply for your small groups that we can share today or yeah, so it so literally, if you just go to Glenda Bio, uh, it'll give you a link to, or you can go to Greatness with Glenda. Probably that's the best place to go. Greatness with Glenda dot com, mm-hmm. and uh, you can always hashtag Google Glenda. Uh, mm-hmm. You can always search me, but probably let's go to Greatness with Glenda dot com, and you can apply for the small group. Uh, we would would love to talk to you a little bit more about how we can bring value and. I'm Glenda Baker everywhere, G-L-E-N-N-D-A, Glenda Baker everywhere. You know, I've, I, I, when I, I want to try to reach back out to you to do this. There was like so many Glenda Bakers. Yeah. I, it was crazy. Are, and well, I couldn't and, tell the difference. Well, and the crazy thing is, is that Instagram. I literally, I literally messaged a, a fake Glenda in the yeah. beginning, you know, because I, I couldn't tell the difference between your two profiles. Yeah. Yeah, you had to get yours verified. They so first off, they they haven't verified me for some unknown reason, but they won't even let me pay for verification because the name on my driver's license is my legal name, and my legal name is Glenda uh, May- uh, Long, uh-huh. and so and my Instagram is Glenda Baker Atlanta. Hmm. Wow, that doesn't seem like that would be a discrepancy. You you wouldn't think so. <laughs> A hundred and forty thousand people have found me. Surely you could yeah. figure out that I am the real Glenda Baker. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for spending so much time with us today and letting us get to know you a little better and what you're doing. And you know, we all appreciate you. Everybody's going to love this this interview. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I can't wait to see you on Glenda's Gurus. Let's do it. Thank all you. Right.